past year, and she did such a great job that we had decided to uh, call her back this year. Diane Brady, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody. I'm wearing a mic, so I'm not sure, but I, I feel like I should mention that I'm not Dutch in case you think I'm lowering the gene pool. So thank you very much for having me back. And I also want to personally thank Paul Pullman. If I look and smell like a dove real woman, it's because of last night's um, goodie bag. So thank you for that. A nice and, uh, you know, relief from what we get at the Westin. So uh, it's a thrill to be back for the Holland on the Hill Heineken Award. I'm going to do some, just, I'm going to get out of your way very quickly, but I do want to mention that we have a lot of questions that will be coming in from Twitter. If you do have questions for Mr. Pullman, please tweet them to hashtag Holland Hill, and they will be brought up during the Q&A portion of the presentation. And this award, as you probably know, is inspired by Freddie Heineken. This is the second year, and I'm thrilled to be back. And I would like to invite up Representative Derek Kilmer of Washington State, who is co-chair of the Congressional Caucus of the Netherlands, otherwise known as the Dutch Caucus, to give some introductory remarks. Well, uh, thanks everybody. I also want to say uh, thank you because I also smell like a dev real woman. Um, maybe that's not good. Uh, I'm Derek Kilmer. I represent Washington State's uh, sixth district and I'm proud to be co-chair of the Dutch caucus. Um, I am the son and grandson of Dutch immigrants. In fact, uh, after last evening's event, I called my grandmother who's now 105 years old um, I hope I have those genes. Uh, and, but, but I'll tell you, one of the coolest things for me is the fact that not only do I have a 105-year-old Dutch immigrant grandmother, but I have a five-year-old daughter who gets to learn lots of things from her. Uh, she has uh, learned that um, uh, pink and yellow sprinkles on toast is a delicious breakfast. Um, <laughs> And that if you boil kale like a long time and then blend it with mashed potatoes, it's like a good hearty thing to eat with sausage and cooks all of the nutrients out of the kale. Um, <laughs> uh, but she's also uh, learned from my grandmother uh, a sense of stewardship. Uh, in fact, um, at my grandmother's urging, uh, we built what in the Kilmer family is referred to as the victory garden outside our home where my daughter grows vegetables. And uh, it's that sense of stewardship that I think not only uh, is part of, uh, of my grandmother's ethic, but it's part of the Dutch ethic and it's certainly part of the ethic we're going to hear about today. Uh, that notion that you can both be successful economically and be good stewards, that you can uh, be good corporate citizens and actually also uh, grow prosperity. So I wanna just simply say thank you to all of our guests uh, for supporting Holland on the Hill and for supporting the Heineken Award. Uh, and without further ado, I, I, it, one of the real joys for me of becoming the co-chair of the Dutch Caucus has been to uh, be able to work with Ambas Ambassador Baking, you know, who has done so much to strengthen the relationship between uh, our countries. He told me earlier that he's gonna be leaving in August uh, and said that he, um, his words were, I will be uh, replaced by a better man. And I told him that in the words of Seattle grunge singer, uh, Eddie Vedder, um, can't find a better man. <laughs> can't find a better man, right? So uh, without further ado, please welcome the ambassador. Thank you. so much, uh, Mr. Congressman. My, my job as the Dutch ambassador is so easy, actually. I mean, and the relations between our two countries are so good, economically as well as politically, that I have a, every day is a field day for me. Um, and more and um, even better, my king and queen are coming within two weeks, which is a, uh, for an official visit, their first visit. They will be going to Washington, obviously, also to Grand Rapids, where there are many, many Americans of Dutch descent. All the names there in the telephone book are Dutch, almost, Hoekstra, Dijkstra, Huizinga. It's just fun to be there. We also go to Chicago later on for an important business dinner. But we also have the, uh, the 
Prime Minister, I mean, there are many, many visitors from Holland, I can assure you. The Prime Minister is going to Atlanta later on in October to, do, to have an economic mission revolving around smart logistics and cyberspace, industries that are important to our economies as well as companies like Unilever. Um, there are two Dutch people, one present, one in, unfortunately not anymore present that I want to highlight today. First, obviously, it's Mr. Paul Polman. Um, we share the same university. Also, I mean, that's where we really got our training, I presume, wasn't it? Or he was even more clever than I am, so he went on to the United States to get his MBA here. I stayed on in Groningen, so that's the difference between you and me. <laughs> but I also want to talk about Freddy Heineken, who I think never actually made it to a university. But he, um, he came to, he was a bit of an outcast within his family at a certain time because he, had, uh, he hadn't managed well. He was the, the grandson of the, of the founder of, of Heineken. I think Heineken was founded in 1864. But he, and he worked, he started working there in 1942. Um, but then it wasn't very much of a success, so they shipped him out to the United States. As, and at that time, very little beer was sold by Heineken here in, in um, the US. Um, he turned out to be a marketing genius, actually. And within, I think, a year, he had um, increased the sale up to 260%. I mean, those are actually, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, Paul, you would like to have those figures also for Unilever. Um, the, um, so in a way, I mean, when your career is at a dead end, you think it's a dead end, actually it might, might be the next, the next thing might be a jump forward. When I, when I after 30 years ago, um, when I was after Washington sent to Africa, I thought I was in a, in a position like that, but obviously I was able to come back to this superb city. Um, Paul Pullman, as I said, is cast from the same mold as Freddie Heineken. He's as innovative and entrepreneurial as, as Freddie was. He's born in the Netherlands, as I said. He studied in Groningen and did an MBA in finance and international marketing at the University of Cincinnati. He spent his career in the consumer goods industry before becoming CEO of Unilever in 2009. Under his leadership, the company adopted an ambitious vision to double its size while reducing its environmental footprint and increasing its positive social impact through the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Also under his leadership, Unilever has become the third largest consumer goods company in the world while maintaining the highest standards of corporate behavior towards employees, consumers, and society. And as a result of this, these efforts, Paul has become highly regarded as a world leader in sustainable supply chain management. Um, in fact, together with my Minister of Trade and Development, Mrs. Prumer, and he signed recently an agreement to ensure that Unilever and the Dutch government continue to work to improve sustainability, addresses especially palm oil and deforestation, and also promotes the productivity of small farmers and women entrepreneurship. He's, in other words, a great example of a Dutch entrepreneur who combines his passion for sustainability with a business acumen he developed while studying and working in both the Netherlands and the United States. Um, and it's just not me saying these words. Minister Plumen, whom I mentioned before, unfortunately couldn't be here this morning, asked me to congrat Paul, congratulate Paul for her. Paul, she wants you and everybody here in the audience to know how much she values your leadership and efforts to make Unilever's supply chain more sustainable, to improve labor conditions, and to enhance the environment of Unilever's production locations. As such, the awards committee has decided that Mr. Pullman is the ideal candidate, and I underline ideal candidate, to receive the second annual Holland on the Hill Heineken Award, an award that represents a silver lion dialder, which was used by the Dutch in New York long ago and is the basis of the word dollar. So Mr. Paul Pullman, please come forward, then I'll hand you it over.
Uh, thanks, Rudolf, and obviously also um, Derek for your nice uh, introductory words. It's uh, interesting with uh, Lillian. I'm glad she knows I'm here. I'll actually see her next week. We have a meeting in the uh, Vatican for the encyclical, which uh, the Pope is working on for climate change, which should come out fairly soon. So I'll see her there, but I'm reminded of the dinner we had in January at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and we had a Tropical Forest Alliance meeting, and John Kerry was going to speak, and we were all sitting at the same table. And there was this little name tag that said Pullman and another name tag that says Pluman. And afterwards, two people came up to me, your wife is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, not surprising that we actually signed that agreement together. But uh, I firmly believe that you have to work with, uh, together in partnership with government, civil society, and, and business to attack some of these bigger issues that we're going to talk in a minute. Let me first say how pleased I am in uh, winning this award, and, and I mean it. There is something, obviously, that comes with a nationality. Uh, I have my orange tie on, and when the Dutch do well, we feel good in any tournament, and when they don't do well, we have a miserable day. Wherever you live in the world, it always stays there. And to get an award that uh, celebrates the important relationships between these two countries, uh, I'm very honored about it. I've been working on that relationship for the last 36 years with my wife from Wisconsin. So I know how tough it is to get a good relationship going between two countries. <laughs> and, uh, but, but we have a long one, we have a long one. If you just see, and you don't have to go back, but uh, from, from the early days in school, you just learn uh, your history lessons and you see that it, uh, America has in fact and, and the Nuts are probably the two most intertwined nations in the world. I don't say that for any other reason but purely factual from the time of the, the, uh, the, the 1603s to the, uh, the first country to recognize the United States by saluting its flag, from helping financing the Louisiana land purchase, the, helping the uh, people, uh, the rebels in that case, or the revolutionaries become uh, independent. We were always there to help uh, hand in hand. I don't know if it was out of love for the land of freedom and provide the opportunities, or, or if it was a little thing that we had with the Brits that we wanted to get in the way, or the French sometimes. But at the end of the day, we've been long-term allies in everything we have. And it's a, uh, an honor, obviously, uh, that, uh, to take this award named after Freddie, which uh, we all admire so much. And uh, I didn't know it was the second one, but uh, Werner uh, getting it last year uh, great admiration for what uh, Amazon does, obviously, because if there is one company that changes the face on how we behave, how we communicate, and how we work together, uh, Amazon is certainly setting a standard, and it should not come as a surprise to you that we as a company work very closely uh, with them. I also wanted to recognize uh, Faye Hartog. I don't know where Faye is sitting, because there are so many bright lights, I can't see you. Uh, you're there in the back, modestly, as always. You know, Faye actually, when she was ambassador to the Netherlands, she uh, met my mother before I met her because she was opening in, uh, from her mother's side, she actually comes from my hometown, Enschede, and she was opening the new synagogue, and my mother was there to go there. I don't know why she went there, probably free cookies or free drinks. But, um, so she met you there, and she had a lovely talk, and then we met on later, and it's actually interesting if you look the, uh, the uh, strong connection that is there, not only with you as ambassador, but the Hartog family goes back for a long time and uh, started out as butchers and ended up making sausages. And, and when you are in the meat business, you soon have the animal fats and you get into the margarine. And in the uh, early 1900s, uh, it clearly was a successful company. In fact, successful to that point that uh, Unilever decided to uh, might be better to buy them. In fact, one of our, if you go back to the reports of Unilever, you will find that uh, when they talked about the Hartog family at that time, is one of those, one of those families whose virility never failed. They were very tenacious and they gave us very hard competition. And in those days when you got a hard competition and we saw them opening a margarine factory in uh, Germany at that time, close to Hamburg, uh, the best thing to do was to quickly buy them. So that is how Hartog actually ended up in the Unilever family. And it's part of the uni, which is the margarine union. Uh, Harold Hartog, we were talking that yesterday night, uh, the grandson of uh, Hartog Hartog, the founder, uh, was actually on the Unilever board. So the connections go back well beyond anything else. It um, was interesting, when I came here yesterday at the airport, I was flying in from Michigan. I'm on the board of uh, Dow Chemical, and we had meetings in Midland. Um, I heard three people talking at the airport. It was kind of interesting because I don't know if you do, but you then sort of listen in. I know it's very unpolite, but I also know that uh, we all do this. So that's why I'm sharing this in, a, in the spirit of Dutch openness. And I quickly found out that it wasn't 
an engineer, a doctor, and an economist that were talking to each other. I thought, it's a strange combination. And the doctor was bragging, and he said, you know, we have the oldest profession in the world. The others say, why is this? Well, you go to the book of Genesis, and you see that Eve came out of the, the ribs of Adam. And both of them survived. That was the first successful operation. We have the oldest profession in the world. The uh, engineer said, I don't think so. I don't think so, because when, when there was chaos, we created the universe. We created order, which is what engineers do. So engineers are the oldest profession in the world. And the economist said, I don't think so, because who created chaos in the first place? And this is a little bit what I wanted to talk about, because uh, what I want to talk about is, is more than ever now, in the spirit of this award, is in fact uh, what the business community can do to leverage what I would call the shared values of humanity and entrepreneurship. They don't go, uh, they don't, uh, are, are, they are not opposite sides. And often you get that impression that, that free enterprise or what Milton Friedman called the business of business, etc., has to go at the expense of creating a better world for all. And I wanted to look at some of these challenges that are there, but also some of these opportunities that we have now in the 21st century. You know, this century is only 15 years old, and if you just look back at the 15 years, there are many young people in the audience, so I don't want to go back so far, but there's an enormous achievement that we've had in these 15 years. Globalization really has worked for many people. Never ever have we actually lifted so many people out of poverty in such a short period of time, 600 million people. A lot of them in China, admittedly, but also in many other parts of the world. In fact, if you look at the Millennium Development Goals that were set in the year 2000, it had as objective to half the number of people living under poverty, and poverty was at that time defined as $1.25 a day. That objective is actually achieved. More people are in education than ever. Healthcare has improved for many people. I would actually submit that were it not for globalization, I wouldn't be here myself. Uh, child mortality has come down. Actually, more girls in education now than any time uh, in the history of mankind. So this world, by any standards, is a healthier and wealthier world, and we should be grateful of that. In fact, it was in, this, uh, in September when I was at the UN for the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, Obama was there as well, and he actually put it, uh, put it very well. He said, this is the best time in history to be born. So you're more likely than ever before to be literate, to be healthy, and to be a free person to pursue your dreams. So I think that is something that, that works. But at the same time, I want to go back to Dickens, uh, Charles Dickens, when he wrote his book, The Tale of Two Cities, which at that time was about the UK and uh, London and France, uh, Paris. And in the tale of two cities, when he starts this book, he says, this was the best of times, this was the worst of times. And I think we're actually in that situation. Although we have made significant progress, uh, it is also clear uh, that we haven't quite achieved a sustainable or inclusive progress. If you look at the crisis of 2007, 2008, if you take that as a starting point, I think a lot of people have realized that what we have created was certainly beneficial for many people in the world but it came at an enormous cost. Cost being an enormous level of public and private debt, which we are still suffering from for decades to come, overconsumption in some parts of the world, and frankly, leaving too many people behind. And my argument has always been very simple. In any system where too many people feel that they are not included or being left behind, that system will ultimately rebel against itself. And that is what exactly what you see happening, increasingly so. For different factors that are coming together, we can talk another time. But uh, the challenges that we have here are clear. And I want to just, because of the limited time that we have, uh, point out one or two of these challenges and how we could address them. The first challenge is a very simple one, which is the challenge of man versus nature. Uh, we're using the world's resources at a faster pace than we can replenish. John Rockström from the Resilience Institute in Stockholm talks about nine planetary boundaries that sort of define the health of this world. Four of them, nitrogen, biodiversity, climate change, and forests are actually what he would call already beyond the minimal acceptable levels. Uh, we're digging in the earth, uh, producing, produ producing, which is sort of a measure of success that we create, uh, but we're, we're depleting, uh, depleting the scarce resources that we have at an enormous rate. Climate change is obviously one of the results of that, which finally now is acknowledged even in this country that that is, you know, with the few skeptics still around, but that that is a man-made occurrence. I think everybody, everybody agrees with that. In fact, if you look at uh, this century, um, the uh, 2014 again was the hottest year on record, and 13 
of the hottest years on record ever registered were in this century, and I don't think that trend will be there, uh, will be interrupted. Uh, this morning again in the papers coming in here in the car, you saw the enormous droughts that are going on in Taiwan now. You might not realize that, but it's the, the since 67 years. Why? Because it's only when they started measuring. Brazil has the, the, the most severe droughts they've ever had since 80 years. Why only 80 years? Because they just start measuring. California now, you're well familiar with that, so parts of Texas. And it's affecting everybody. It's affecting people and their behavior. It's affecting industries that are moving out. The costs are real. In fact, it is estimated that the U.S. alone, the cost of natural disasters just in the last uh, decade has been uh, Hurricane Sandys and the droughts, etc., has been anywhere between 300 and 500 billion. And that's the cost to the U.S. government and, and its economic system. But there's a cost to humanity. There's a cost to business that is way beyond that. We're getting to the point right now with these planetary boundaries that the cost of not acting is actually higher than the cost of acting. You take Brazil, I was just talking to our general manager, when the water reserves are at 30%, they use hydroelectricity, energy prices go up, energy gets cut off. If you're in the ice cream business, good luck, buddy. If you're in the shampoo business, the incidence of showering is down by 15 to 20% because there simply isn't enough water to shower. Business is paying the price, and they actually see it earlier than many of the governments do, and that's not surprising for that reason that you see business stepping up and becoming so active and focal. Often we get the impression that this focal minority is the wisdom that is out there, but there is an enormous, perhaps still not focal enough, majority of people that is now drastically asking for, for action in that area. So I think the most important thing that we need to do this year is the climate change agreements in Paris, which will happen in December. They're called the COP21, where we need to have a binding and ambitious agreement on climate change. Uh, the US has submitted its targets already. China has given indications. For the first time, we have some emerging markets coming forward already before many others. Mexico has submitted its targets. Uh, Russia has. And in fact, I'll be off after this talk to the White House to talk a little bit more on how can we maintain that momentum. It's absolutely key that we uh, decarbonize the economy, not only for the costs and risks or often the poor people that will suffer from it, if you want to talk to humanitarian reasons, but also for the enormous opportunities. Just decarbonating the economy is a three to 10 trillion opportunity in new economy. And this country understands that well, because most of the technologies and most of the ideas or the new business models uh, that are needed to green the economy is actually, uh, this country is very well placed to play a key role. So I would say it just makes an enormous uh, economic sense. And increasingly so. We just issued a report on the new climate economy uh, task force where I was part of under the leadership of Felipe Calderon, uh, Nick Stern and many others, which we call uh, better, better uh, growth, better climate, uh, where we can really show you that uh, investing right now in climate mitigation and, and the right investments in infrastructure, agriculture, energy, is actually making good business sense for any economy that, that is doing that. The second challenge I briefly wanted to talk about is the challenge of few versus many. This is really uh, a moment that the Gini coefficients, which talks about the income disparity between the, the top income earners and the bottom income earners, is actually widening in all countries bar one. Ecuador is the only exception right now. But all countries see the income differences going up, including in this country, obviously. Uh, it is really... Uh, uh, a little bit troublesome. Uh, Ox uh, Oxfam just issued a report at the time of the World Economic Forum that now says in 2016, which is not far off, that 1% of the wealthiest in this world have now the same wealth as the bottom 50%. And obviously the technological divide is one of the uh, key, uh, key challenges there that we have to deal with. So this is a world that's enormously stressed, a world where too many people are excluded, and actually that is happening before another two to three billion people come into this world. And frankly, we're still a lot of people uh, hoping for uh, uh, the same opportunities that we have taken for granted. So this is where the pressure points come in. You take consumption, for example, where we are beyond the planetary boundaries. The top one and a half billion people in this world consume 75% of the world's resources. The bottom one billion people consume 1%, but they sure aspire <laughs> to do the same as the top. We all have these hopes, and they're increasingly visible in this age of transparency that we live in. Um, this, the scale of the challenges became very clear to me when uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon asked me to be part of the high-level panel for the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the follow-up of the Millennium Development Goals. And what um, it's very clear is if you look at the statistics, uh, this is not a business, uh, this is not a world that is in balance. This is not a world where you can say uh, the, the, the forces of economics or the invisible hands or, 
or the business community or the pricing mechanisms will ultimately take care of it. Because why is it afterwards, after all, that in, in 2015 that we live, that one, of eight, one in eight people still go to bed hungry, not knowing if they wake up the next day? Why is it that two and a half billion people don't have access to clean water and sanitation even today? Why is it that one out of 20 children uh, doesn't make it past the eights of five? And be it the people that go to bed hungry every night, or be it the people that don't have access to clean water or sanitation, or be it the child that doesn't make it past the eights of five, I can tell you one thing, it's not your children. But increasingly in many parts of the world, it is actually at the roots of all the issues that we see, issues of security, issues of uh, economic growth, issues of making our global system function. So ultimately we pay that price for it if we don't um, attack it. And that brings me obviously to the challenge that we have is how do we create a world that is more inclusive where we can have sustainable and equitable growth. I would even go one step further is how do we create a world where we can irreversibly eradicate poverty in a more sustainable and equitable way. And I think there's a very, very challenging moment right now that we live in that we could be the first and only generation that actually eradicates that poverty if we would rise to that challenge. And we could also be the last generation that has to deal with the effects of climate change if we rise to that challenge. And by the way, climate change and poverty are two sides of the same coin. It's the effects of climate change are basically felt by the poor people in this world because we've built up an enormous level of resilience around that. So we need to, I'm certainly not preaching and, and certainly in this holy building here of US free enterprise and free wealth, I'm not preaching any uh, other form of, of, uh, of uh, economic form than what we have created. And I'm certainly very happy with the system that we call conveniently capitalism. What I'm only advocating is, just like Roosevelt did with the New Deal in the US, at a certain point in time you have to evolve systems to adapt to the changing environments that you're in. It's the same for all of us. And it's time to adapt capitalism to a more conscious or more inclusive or more uh, enlightened capitalism. In fact, interestingly, in Europe where not many things are growing, one of the only things that is growing are books about capitalism. Capitalism on the brink, conscious capitalism, capitalism reinvented. I was flying back the other day from India with my wife and I said, I think I'm going to write a book. And she said, well, but you promise never to write a book because I sort of have this fear that any CEO who writes a book it usually ends up being an ego trip or look how good I am. And within a year, they're usually out of office. So I've always stayed away from writing books. <laughs> but I told her, I'm going to write a book about capitalism. She said, what, do you go, what are you going to call it? I said, 50 Shades of Capitalism. So <laughs> if you have any ideas for the chapters, just bring it in. You know, it was Winston Churchill that said, democracy is the worst form of governance, except for all the other ones invented. And he was right. And the same thing is for capitalism. It's probably the best way that we have invented to deal together. But we also are clear that it falls short. And the best we have is clearly no longer good enough in terms of addressing some of these issues. And, and that is really um, the question then is, what do we need to do? Uh, and my only argument here is business, at the end of the day, which is 60% of the global economy, which is 80% uh, of the financing globally now, which is 90% of the job creation, cannot stay on the sideline. It simply isn't enough anymore to say we have to be at the right side of the law. Business has to become an active participant in a system that gives them life in the first place. So they have to move, especially in a difficult political situation now, where issues have become far more complex and far more global to deal with, where politicians have a hard time dealing with these issues of global financing, global tax, global transparency, climate change. When you bring 190 people in the room, it's not easy. Business has an opportunity, but also a responsibility to step up. So you need to move from a license to operate, which is basically the premise of most of the companies, to a license to lead. Now, the one thing that that requires, as you will all realize with me, is, is the word trust. Trust is low. Trust is low in politicians. We know that. It's not getting better according to the Edelman surveys, but trust is also low in business. And uh, I hate to say in CEOs it's even lower. And not surprising. Compensations that are way out of proportion. Manipulations of LIBOR rates or foreign currency rates. Selling horse meat instead of beef. Or thinking it's cool to buy a t-shirt that's worth one dollar whilst about 1,050 innocent women lose their lives in a collapsing factory in Rana Plaza. Fortunately, we live, or unfortunately for some, but fortunately I believe we live in the age of transparency now, where things are known very quickly. 
where people can find out now what is happening in one side of the world and how it affects other people in other parts of the world. It's not surprising now that you see the tenure of a CEO being only four years or less in this country, voted out of office relatively quickly. It's not surprising that the average length of a public company is only 18 years. Unilever has been around for 150 years and plans to be around for a lot more. But in order to do that, you have to earn a license to operate. It's not given to you anymore. But you also have to change your business model. Just to take from society or be less bad doesn't work anymore. You have to become an active contributor to positively address some of these challenges that are out there. The challenges of food security, the challenges of climate change, the challenges of water shortage, etc. I'm fortunate enough to be in my seventh year on the job and long may it last, although my wife would disagree with that statement. But um, some of these issues require longer term solutions. You cannot do that with quarterly profits. You cannot do that with just focusing on shareholder premacy. For that reason in Unilever, when I became CEO, we abolished guidance, we abolished quarterly reporting, we changed compensation systems for the long term. It was very important to put a business model out there and a uh, environment to operate in where people could make the right decisions, the decisions for the longer term. And actually it changed a lot the way we are running our business but also the, com the communication we have with the financial industry. The um, two issues that we need to attack, which I think create an environment for more businesses to be responsible, is to attack the issues of uh, profit with purpose, uh, very briefly, and the issues of short-termism that I talk about. Let me start with the profit uh, with purpose. I think many businesses, unfortunately, with this focus on shareholder premacy, very prevalent in this country more so than ever, uh, have lost their reason for being. Often it is felt that your reason for being is, is just to simply focus on enhancing the shareholder value, which are often compared with owners of a company. The real reason for being why businesses were invented is to solve a problem out there. Business can only operate if society accepts them to operate. And the greatest businesses and the greatest ideas, including Lord Lever when he invented the bar soap, was to attack a problem. It wasn't to give a shareholder his quarterly profits. In the issue, in our case, it was the issue of Victorian Britain where hygiene was, was a very big issue. One out of two babies didn't make it past year one. That's why he invented it. So we have to go back to putting squarely the purpose of business in the center of what we do. Doing that well and focusing on that will ultimately benefit the shareholders as well as many other stakeholders, there's no doubt about it. But the purpose of business is quite different than the shareholder premacy. So the, um, and by the way, I think the, uh, by focusing on other things, as we have been doing, the shareholder ultimately will benefit, as we've been showing uh, that as well. Now, the uh, second thing, very briefly, is uh, short-termism. We have uh, to distinguish, I think, between short-term share traders and what I would call longer-term shareholders. Even a company like Unilever now, the average market cap of a company like ours is traded in about four months' time, less than an annual report. And uh, obviously this day trading has become a, a big factor on that. It's not surprising that Larry uh, Fink, who runs BlackRock, one of the bigger uh, institutional investors here, um, warn people about the short-term pressure because it's also making his market disappear. Companies actually increasingly are cutting capital expenditures, are increasing their debts and leveraging them up to give special dividends and increases in, uh, in share buybacks, etc. Just in the US right now in the first quarter, one trillion has been given back, which actually should be invested in the economy to provide growth and job opportunities. Companies are not doing that right now because for the different reasons we talked about. So uh, the second thing is obviously the role of the boards in this thing. Most of the CEOs will tell you in a recent survey, the World Economic Forum as well, that a lot of the pressures on this short-termism actually comes from their own boards. The fiduciary duties of boards are not to have quarterly maximization of profits. The fiduciary duties in any country that at least I'm aware of is to ensure that there's a future proofing of the organization, that it can exist for long times to come. It's a very good thing that you did in this country by creating the B corporations, which stand for benefit corporations. They are now recognized in 26 states, including in your state. And that's a very important thing. And the state of Delaware, actually, is where there's a legal protection now for companies to really take into account the multiple stakeholder aspects, not only the shareholder, but also to look at the other positive impacts on society. At Unilever, 
Obviously, we want to be part of that responsibility of changing this world to make it a better and more inclusive world. But that journey, obviously, is a long one, and we can't do it alone. In 2009, as I said, we changed the environment around it, but we also changed our business model. We said, indeed, we double our turnover because there's enough opportunity to grow in this world. But we do this by decoupling our growth from environmental impact and improving our social impact. Now, what is different from others is that we take responsibility of the total value chain from farm to fork. And we take co-responsibility of all issues that come with it. If you're in the food business like us, which is part of our business, you are as much responsible of finding, being sure that the food security issues are being solved, as well as finding the jobs for the smallholder farmers when we need to create an employment. And when we need to create employment for the smallholder farmers, you need to especially focus on women and land rights and other things. You're equally responsible for the food waste that is occurring in this world at, at ridiculous rates, by the way. Or on the other side, the obesity, which is the uh, biggest epidemic we're going to see with diabetes too. You're equally responsible for deforestation. 40% of the demand of food is actually uh, driving an enormous, 40% uh, uh, of the deforestation is being driven by the enormous demands of food. So our model goes across the total value chain. And what we have seen is by taking that responsibility, setting some audacious targets, we want to have our total business model sustainable, otherwise you cannot do decoupling. We want to increase our social impact, so we make targets of creating jobs for five million women, five million smallholder farmers, reaching one billion people, improving their health and well-being, being sure that all of our agricultural raw materials are sustainably sourced. Frankly, all these things we should be doing normally in any course of business, in my opinion. It's interesting, after five years into this plan, 55% of our materials are now sustainably sourced. We were already by far seen as the number one five years ago when we only had 15%. We're still number one in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, but we've done five times more in five years than what it took us for 150 years. We've reached 400 million people improving their health and well-being, mainly by simply hand washing. Two million children die every year because of infectious diseases, pneumonia, diarrhea, and all these things. Simply the acts of hand washing can cut that down by 60, 70%. So we're proud of that, saving lives. And, uh, and then all of our factories and all the other things are, uh, we have green energy here in the US, in Europe, our factories are zero waste. What's wrong with that? If you think about that and you plan it properly, it can be done. And by the way, you don't lose your competitiveness. Our share price is up very well, shareholders are happy, our business has grown 30%. So doing the business in the right way doesn't have to be incompatible was having a successful and profitable business. The one thing I'm most excited about, obviously, is the function of our brands. When we say business needs to have a purpose, most importantly, if you're in a consumer goods company like mine, your brands need to have a purpose. And what we can now show is that after five years in this journey, that the brands that have a better developed purpose even than others, you could argue every brand should have a purpose, but some obviously are better along on that spectrum than others, are actually growing at twice the rate for us and are more profitable. Brands like Ben & Jerry's is a great brand. It's an activist brand, fighting in the UK for same-sex marriages or saving the coral reef barriers in Australia or here in this country going touring the country right now with a, a, a wonderful ice cream variant, uh, Save the Swirls, which has saved the world with uh, climate change. And the brand is growing double digit. Or a brand like Dove that uh, Diane mentioned, working on women's self-esteem. Or a brand like Purit, which is one of our water brands, giving billions of liters of water to people that are deprived. A brand like Lifebuoy I talked about. Not surprisingly, all these brands with stronger purpose are growing faster as well. But not only that, since we've moved to this model, we've actually become the third most looked up company in LinkedIn after Apple and Google. Now my mother is 89, she doesn't understand that. I'm a little younger, I don't understand that either. Like Apple or Google, they're at least company brands. We are sort of Unilever is a little bit more abstract. But people want to work for companies that make a difference. People know that someone's worth is not meant, not someone's self-worth is certainly not measured by someone's net worth. Especially young people understand that they want to make a difference. And they want to work for companies that make a difference. Not surprisingly, we find ourselves as one of the most uh, uh, in-demand uh, employers and, and preferred employers in all the countries that we operate, which frankly is my 
statistic that gives me most reassurance that we have a long and bright future. Now, most of the things that we're doing are fine. I also have three children, and if I come home and say Unilever has done all these things and has taken a little bit more recognition and some prices and all the other things, but nobody else hasn't, uh, has moved, we haven't moved the needle. We've still filled. So the biggest challenge that we have is create these partnerships, these transformational partnerships for impact. That's the only thing that ultimately counts. I'm very happy to see here that with the uh, U.S. government and my good friend Russia, who was leading USAID, we have taken enormous steps forward by working together again in partnerships like the Tropical Forest Alliance, working on deforestation, in partnerships like Grow Africa, to make Africa again food independent and bring sustainable uh, 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 sustainable agriculture there, or even in partnerships together with India. I was there not long ago with the Shwas Bharat program, or what is called Clean India, where the U.S. is very actively uh, helping, or programs like nutrition with scaling up nutrition. The U.S. has always taken a responsibility that goes well beyond its boundaries, and we need to be sure, and that will certainly be one of the discussions I'll be having, that even in the current environment that you are, that you are not abdicating those responsibilities. Uh, it's absolutely important that we continue to get that key role being played by these, uh, these, uh, this country. Now, there are some challenges. There are undoubtedly some challenges there internally in a company when you change your business model, where you have to uh, take these social and environmental externalities into account. That's hard work. There are challenges with investors when you move to a different business model and say that they're not the first reason for being. Some have a hard time understanding that. There are challenges working in partnerships. There are challenges with more transparency that you have to build. But frankly, I challenge you, if you don't build transparency, if you don't work in that partnership and openness, where is that trust going to come from? I'm married for 36 years and I always say, the, probably the only reason I've been married for 36 years is that I've never hidden my agenda from my wife. The moment I do that, I probably won't be married anymore, you see? So this transparency is an enormous opportunity for all of us to re-establish trust and then to be actively involved in providing these positive contributions. I don't want to take too much time anymore, but I do want to stress the enormous opportunities that are there and how this country specifically can lead in these opportunities. Companies like Apple or Google or Microsoft are taking enormous leaps forward. They've all greened their energy supply. Uh, the, the cloud, as it's called, is 3 to 4% of global energy. They've all spent a billion or more in creating green parks or solar parks and doing that economically very efficiently. But they're also investing in the future. Nest. I don't know if any of you have nests that control your home and your home temperature. It's a good example where Google, for example, has made an investment. Or take Tesla. Not surprising that Tesla is in this country. Let me give you one little example. Tesla produces about, Tesla produces about 40,000 cars right now. Not that many. And if you look at the, the 40,000 cars that they produce, contrast that to the 9 million cars that General Motors produces. Yet the market cap of Tesla is already half of the market cap of General Motors. So even the financial community catches on. Not surprisingly, innovations, enormous opportunities to create this better world for all. The U.S. very well placed. And momentum is building. Even if sometimes it seems that governments are not having this highly enough on their programs or if they're not ambitious enough. In fact, 75 percent of the world's largest companies now have social and environmental goals. A thousand of them signed the World Bank statement for carbon pricing when we were here in, in September, a statement that uh, Jim Kim very capably led. 4,000 companies now specifically report on CO2 and have carbon reduction targets on CO2, more than 6% a year that is needed to stay below the 2 degrees. And not surprisingly, which I'm very happy about, increasingly the financial community is getting involved. We have 34 trillion of capital now, much of it located here, asking for a price on carbon. Even the World Bank, I was reading last week in the newspapers, is starting to look at their own pension plans to see where they should invest and where they should not invest. This year is a crucial year. It's a crucial year for mankind. It's a crucial year for the future generations, a responsibility we cannot escape. It's probably the Bretton Wood moment for our generation if you want to do that. Three important things are happening that help us to create this better blueprint or this moral framework for the world in absence of governments by themselves being able to move things forward. The first one, just in sequence of timing, is the upcoming uh, Finance for Development Conference in Addis Ababa, which takes place in July. We have to figure out how we make this financing work to make this world more sustainable. We have to figure out what climate financing means. 
the red funds, the, the, green, uh, the, the green growth fund, and, and uh, mechanisms for development. If we don't figure that out, then the other things don't work. Very, very important. A lot of people working that hard. Then in September, we're here in New York for the Sustainable Development Goals, that hopefully there are 17 goals and 69 targets that hopefully are ambitious enough to help the people that couldn't be there, either because they're not around anymore or they're simply too hungry to show up or they haven't had a chance to go get education and be able to express their own points of view. And then in December, in Paris, we have the COP21 to, uh, to attack the issues of climate change and, and human development, if you want to. The, um, it is a development agenda. It is an economic advancement agenda. It is a growth agenda. But above all, I would say, even as a businessman, it's an agenda of morality. If you are as fortunate as we are and you belong to the 2% of the population that we do, can do what they want, work where they want, be financially independent, live where they want, then it is our duty. It is our duty to spend all of our time and energy to give that same opportunity to the other 98%. I just want to simply end with uh, the pragmatic and the prophetic words of Nobel Prize laureate uh, Wangari uh, Matai, who said that in the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called upon to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground. I believe the time is now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. I think you get a sense of the passion that Paul has and how much, how unusual it is. I just want, I don't even know how much time we have. I feel like we're just sitting back going, wow. When you went back five years ago and launched this initiative, you talked about the tenure of CEOs. Were you not worried that perhaps that what you were laying the groundwork for a short tenure to be talking about discarding short-term um, you know, estimates of earnings and carbon footprints and the like. What, did it make you nervous at all since you were really out there in front of a lot of CEOs talking about this? Well, what probably, uh, you always have to have a certain level of nervousness because you don't know how these things are going to play out and, and obviously a lot of the, uh, the, the, the road we are walking has never been walked by others. But I so firmly believe as one of my principles it's better to make the dust than eat the dust. But. Um, one of the things that we said when we came with this audacious plan, uh, we simply said uh, two things, which I think in hindsight have uh, helped us tremendously. Uh, first of all, it's a long-term plan, it's not a short-term plan. And the other thing we said is we simply can't do it alone. These issues are so humongous. And, and we don't have all the answers, which made it a little bit more human. And I think that helped us attract the right people to walk this journey with us. It's interesting, people forget, so when you were in Cincinnati, you spent 25 years at Procter & Gamble, and then you actually left business to start a charity. Is that right, the Kilimanjaro right. Blind? What drew you back? Why did you leave business, and what brought you back into the realm of well, I never wanted to be in. Uh, I never wanted to be in business. I work for big companies. It sounds strange, but sometimes life goes with a certain level of serendipity, and you go with the flow, and bills have to be paid. And um, So I ended up in Cincinnati for totally different reasons, and... Then if you are in Cincinnati, P&G is not that far. I was, uh, I was doing two studies at the same time, so I took evening classes and there were P&G people. I had to make money. The dollar was very strong at that time. My father certainly didn't have money, so I had to work as a maintenance man in a building and that was also P&G. So it was fairly logical then to be sucked into that environment and then sort of, you know, you start moving around and you become a corporate, uh, corporate executive before you know it. But it was never really uh, my goal, to be honest. I, I first wanted to be a priest, and I wanted to be a doctor. In Holland, they have this uh, lottery system, so I never got in, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And uh, then you get to a point that you think I might well go on. But when I was about 50, I had my normal midlife crisis, like anybody else did. And I thought it's probably, uh, probably time to get out of corporate life. I'd seen some things there that weren't very pleasing to me, and I'm not so much into politics. So what brought you back? Well, because I discovered that perhaps I can make right now more difference in what I do doing this than any other thing, and uh, with a little level of, of modesty or humility. And if you can have that impact, then I think it's, you know, you have that obligation. I'm very fortunate that we work in a company that is in 190 countries or reaches 2 billion people a day, and, 
and I still feel now that, that probably we can achieve now more. If we can show that uh, business can be done differently, that there is a plan B, that you can be successful by doing the right things, uh, that you don't have to answer the question anymore, why do you do it, but that we increasingly start to focus on companies that don't and ask them, why don't you do it, uh, then hopefully we can change the system to the benefit of everybody and you feel you've made a little difference. I was actually asking on Twitter questions that people had for you, and one was, if you were starting out now, what would you be doing? Since I know you're quite <laughs> active with uh, you know, talking to young people, what would be your advice be? Would you be trying to build a career in a big corporation like Unilever? Oh, I'd be a social entrepreneur in today's world, but you cannot put yourself back. I never look back, by the way. Uh, I've always uh, operated under the principle, which I try to tell my three sons as well, is create a lot of opportunities, but take the one that your passion leads you to and, and never look back. So, so create, your advice is create your own business. Go uh, off. I, I'm very impressed by a lot of social entrepreneurs. I think the answer in this world, why I am uh, fairly uh, optimistic, is that uh, because of the age of transparency will help us drive different behavior, but also because of the young. Uh, the young, uh, you take Europe and the US, which often is a lot of focus of our discussions, but frankly, in 30 years' time, there are only 20% of the world population. 80% of the world population will live uh, outside of Europe and the US. And the average age is about 25 years old. Uh, uh, sorry, 50% is below 25 years old. A country like Liberia has 57% of the population below 15 years old. So, although they're half of the population now, they know that they're 100% tomorrow, and they are incredibly creative to come with solutions that, uh, uh, to try to, to, to change the way business is done. So enormous ideas that you probably don't find in companies of our size anymore. For that reason, we do two things. I spend a lot of time on uh, connecting the young and their networks. They're very technology savvy. So things like We Day, One Young World, Global Shapers, uh, Impact, uh, all the other, uh, things that we have, uh, Ashoka Fellows, and see if we can actually galvanize them a little bit better. And the second thing is uh, we created this uh, Unilever Social Entrepreneur Award, which we're very honored that the Prince of Wales is uh, the chair of that. And last year we had 800 uh, social entrepreneurs uh, uh, participating and then directly or indirectly connecting to our business model. We make them more successful, hopefully, but we also make our own business model stronger. So you talked a little bit about you writing a book. You joked about the Fifty Shades of uh, Capitalism. That wasn't a joke. So, but I, yeah, if you are writing, if you were writing a book, give me some sense of just um, what, what would be your, if you were not in this role, well, give me some sense of sort of leadership today, because you've sort of said that we're not rising to the task necessarily. I can't quite see if you're optimistic about your peer group or if you're disheartened by the lack of momentum in some of these areas? No, there is, uh, I, I've uh, often said it's too late to be a pessimist, so uh, I don't go that route because it doesn't lead to anything. Uh, and I focus on actually, um, often we spend too much energy focusing on trying to get everybody in the room to agree on something. I've come away from that a little bit. I focus on the right amount of people to see if you can make change. So, and it often doesn't need more than, often doesn't need more than 30, 30 governments, might be governments, might be NGOs, might be, but the way we are now moving out of deforestation in places like Indonesia, Malaysia, around palm oil, or we're now going to attack soy and other things, it needs about 30, the biggest traders, the biggest users, the governments, some financing institutions like the World Bank or others uh, represented here, and, and you can actually move the needle forward. You create a tipping point and then others will join, other companies, and, and slowly you change. For a few things, you might need governments to put regulations in place or, or change regulation. A good example is the uh, five to six hundred billion per for subsidy we still have in this world on carbon, which absolutely doesn't make sense. And especially with the low price of, of oil right now, it's the moment to get out of it. So you have to work with governments on some of that, but basically focus on creating these tipping points, and I like to do that. But you know, a lot of CEOs feel uncomfortable because it's complex out there. You need to be a systemic thinker. Any time it's like a balloon, you squeeze somewhere, it pops up somewhere else. This whole water, food, energy nexus is not easy. And then how do you distill it into simple things and action? So it's hard work, and the world is not helping you on that, you know? When you think about sort of the qualities you look for um, in terms of just leadership, I know some people say curiosity, others say they, they look for hunger. What do you look for when either you're sort of hiring the team around you, when you're even looking at entrepreneurs, who to acquire, who to dump? Well, dump, we don't, we don't use don't that. Dump. We just, uh, 
we just see if people would be happier somewhere gently, else. Gently, gently show the door. No, no, no. There are different skill sets needed in different parts of, of your life in different areas. That's for all of us. I would be terrible in 99.99% of the jobs out there, but you know, you try to, to uh, balance uh, the right skill sets, what you need around uh, the things, and that's what we do in the company as well. No, I think the skill sets for leadership, I would say first and foremost, just be a human being. You know, don't try to be someone else. And, uh, and we spend a lot of time looking at our values. Uh, we, we believe that if, if your values are aligned with our values, you'd ultimately be successful. We hire intelligent people. Skills need to be learned and unlearned at an increasingly fast pace, so it doesn't matter really what you studied. But to really see what someone's values are. And obviously with our Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, we have put these values a little bit more openly out there, and that's probably why it attracts easier the right people. You hear so often that not many people want to work anymore for big corporates, I understand that but we don't seem to have that problem. So the leadership skills you need in today's world, I don't know, we can talk a lot about a lot of them, but the basic skills are always there of hard work and all that stuff and integrity. But I think more than ever, you need to have uh, people that have a high level of awareness of what is going on in the world. And that alone is not enough. You would need to have a high level of engagement to want to be involved and to care about others and the common good. And then you need to operate probably with a high level of uh, humanity and humility, I would it, say. It's interesting. You mentioned the recent report that your sustainable brands are growing at twice the rate. Mm. What if they weren't? Would, would that derail your plans around sustainability? No, it would not derail my plans from doing what is right in the first place, which you have to say with a certain level of modesty. But, you know, we, we have no rights to steal from our future generations. We have no rights to pollute, even though we don't have to pay for these externalities whilst others end up paying for it. We have no rights to operate in, in our relationships on a win-only situation versus a win-win situation. Uh, we just have to go back to the same, same mindset as our parents after the war. I was born in 1956, and you know, they, they were truly focused on the common good. They wanted us to have education because they were deprived of education. They wanted uh, Europe to be peaceful because they were deprived of peace. They wanted their communities in which they worked to be successful. My parents met at Boy Scouts. Uh, you know, they worked for their church and other things. So if we put our interest into working for the common good, we will actually benefit ourselves tremendously from that as well. And that is what I think you see with these brands and why they're doing so successfully. It's, it's interesting you talk about shareholders too. How have shareholders reacted to sort of the moves that you've made? And just more generally, we've seen a lot of activism of shareholders right now. I mean, obviously, not so easy to take over a company like Unilever. But when you look at the environment, as an investor, how would you be looking at where to put your money yeah. and the growth that where you can get that short-term growth? Yeah. So activism is not uh, even a company like Apple or something. So irrespective of size. Of, uh, of the company. I think we're all uh, worried about that now. There's so much money floating around the world and the returns are difficult to get, so they try to go everywhere and we need to be mindful of that. But what um, we spend a lot of time on trying to attract the right long-term shareholders. By not having your quarterly reporting, my conversations are not anymore of when we have uh, Easter or if, if the weather was good or bad for my ice cream. We tend to have a little bit more mature, longer-term conversation, and that uh, attracts the right long-term investors. We also spend a lot of time explaining to them why working our model uh, in terms of reputation or costs or opportunities is actually good for shareholders who want to be with you for a long term. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, we've been able to get results, so we haven't been tested as much yet, and I wonder, obviously, when that moment comes. Uh, I hope I'm still there because having a little bit more experience makes it easier. But then the test is how many of your shareholders will stick with you or, or chase the money. Well, this is a question that came in from uh, Twitter on leadership. How much longer do you see yourself leading Unilever and what would you do next? A little bit of a... Oh, that would be a market-sensitive question. <laughs> the, um, um, uh, I think if you have made this commitment, because nobody forced you to do this job. So when, when I got this opportunity and was privileged enough to take this job, which has a lot of serendipity to it, then you have to give it 100% if you have uh, that responsibility. So as long as I'm here, I will give that 100% and not think of anything else. Um, having said that, because um, the, I spend a lot equal, not an equal amount of time, but an equal amount of passion with my own foundation, because I think there is a enormous opportunity to work uh, for the disadvantaged. I'm uh, chairman of uh, Perkins International School mm -hmm. for the Blind, 
which is here in uh, Massachusetts. We have programs in 60 countries. Uh, we're trying to be sure that every person with visual disabilities has a chance to go to school, has their pen or pencil, which is a Braille machine. And uh, we're making great progress there against the odds because there's not an economic model. So I like the challenge, but I also like it because it uh, keeps you humble. Anytime you see that people that have to deal with those challenges, how positive they are and what dreams they have, it just reminds us what this is all about. And it's sometimes good to uh, count your blessings. Well, this, this is a question that is, uh, I think, coming very much from a Dutch perspective, but I think you can also broaden it. Who should be the successor for the next Holland Hill Heineken Award in 2016? <laughs> so you can do that or tell us a little That's bit enough. about who you admire. You're out there in the front lines. You've seen a lot of leaders, public sector, private yeah, sector. Yeah, I don't think you will use these instances to announce next year's winner, and it's certainly not, it, not my prerogative. You to put you on the committee, Not the my prerogative to do that, but you, the, the people say, who... who um, who are leaders that you admire, et cetera. And I think there are many of them. And, and they are actually in different places than, than you might expect. We can all say the, the Gandhis or the Martin Luther Kings or the uh, Nelson Mandela's, and I think there's an offset about them. But who I really admire, because leaders are at every level. To me, leadership is positively influencing someone else. So I have a broad definition about leadership. So the true leaders were the medical staff that went into West Africa trying to fight Ebola, knowing that they probably put their own risk, lives at risk, and in fact, over 500 lost their lives. The true leaders to me are the underpaid uh, nurses or teachers in schools who unselfishly invest in future generations at, at, at difficult circumstances if you look at some of the inner schools and other things. Uh, the people that work for a lot of the uh, NGOs. Um, so to me, true leadership is, is uh, put, put that interest of the common good ahead. And, uh, and fortunately, we are blessed with many good leaders in that respect. It's interesting, and this relates to a question here too around, you talked a lot about some of the low-hanging fruit when you get into a role, whether it's sustainability or income disparity, moving that next billion out of uh, poverty could be tough, Mo getting that next 45% of resources, you know, sustainable yeah. could be tough. What are the pain points that you think about and what has proven to be tougher than you anticipated? Um, I always say we are short of leaders and trees. At the end of the day, uh, to your previous question, it's individuals that change the world. And we need to create more courage uh, or provide an environment where we have more courageous or vanguard leaders, ultimately. And we are in short supply of those right now. Why is that, do you think? Uh, I think the environment uh, is difficult. The, the, the tenure, the, the, the public uh, uh, scrutiny, uh, the press, the, uh, you know, the tough economic environment. Uh, there are many factors you could argue but to me, no excuses. But uh, having said that, we have a lot of programs that we're working on to see if we can create more leaders and give breathing space. Uh, the other thing is, uh, is trust, really. You have to work on the trust factor. The, uh, to solve the issues that we are talking about today, uh, we have to clearly work at a different level than that these issues were created. It's a little bit like Einstein who said the definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So. We have to start working at a different level, and that is this partnership that I'm advocating for. Most of the projects that we do in Unilever, we will do that with governments and NGOs. I don't want to do it to get, uh, alone. One reason I don't want to do it alone is because I don't have that permission to do it alone, because I don't have that wisdom, and I'm not an elected official. So why should we have our arrogance of our size dictate on others what to do? So we involve governments like with Lillian now, with the Dutch Foreign Aid or USAID or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or NGOs like Greenpeace or WWF and many others, Oxfam, UNICEF, Save the Children. And we find that if we cooperate with each other, we can really reach another billion, billion and a half people that otherwise would not be reachable. A good example would be the tea plantations. You know, we're expanding now. It's a tough, tough thing, tea plantations. So we're expanding these now because I like these. If you do sustainable tea and you teach people, you can get a two-acre plot and you can get a good income. And it's hand-picking, so it's a labor-intensive. You create jobs and you give people opportunities and hope and participation. So, but a company like ours wouldn't have the financial means to do all of this. So you work with NGOs to do the training. Uh, you work with governments to work on infrastructures or land or with some of these governments' rules of law, transparency. And if you put the, the right people together again, you can reach quite a lot more people than otherwise would be possible. So I think, I'm not sure if we're getting sort of the time signal to a few minutes, but let me just um, ask quickly around being a global company, because I think that's one thing that 
um, of people are all, we see a lot of whether it's tax arbitrage or lots of opportunities to make investments around the world. Tell us a little bit about how you're looking at the global landscape, because you've been very much invested in emerging markets, right. which have been tough. Right. How, how are you thinking about, is it a long-term bets essentially? Is it looking at where the entrepreneurial energy can come from and the impact that you can have? Yeah, we're in 190 countries, so there are a few countries like North Korea that are, that are fairly obvious ones that we are not in, but we are basically in every country. and. Uh, we, we, we look at this quite long term, to be honest. Uh, most of the investment cycles that companies have right now are, are five years or more. You build a factory or you go into China or whatever you want to, Myanmar now or Ethiopia, those are 10-year decisions you have to make. So we tend to uh, take a little bit of a different view perhaps than some of the other companies. Now, uh, on a global level, I think we'll, we have a tough time. I've always said that the global economy is not motoring. We've put in, since the crisis in 2007, 2008, we've put in another 25 trillion into the economy. Europe is just putting in another 1 trillion. And if you look at the growth we have generated, this probably has been one of the worst investments in human mankind. Mm. If I would have invested in our business that way, I probably would have lost my job very quickly. That's probably one of the reasons why so many politicians are losing their jobs. But we haven't figured out on how to make the economic system grow. Uh, and, and that's a challenge. We also see technology coming in, which has many big, big advantages, but it will be a, an enormous job destroyer, in my opinion. So there's a big challenge, again, is how do you make that inclusive? So I like to invest in things that attack those challenges, and I also believe if you ultimately do that, you create the right uh, consumers, you create the right loyalty and trust to make your company successful. And fi I'd be remiss, we're in Washington, the 202 area code, I'd be remiss if I didn't say final words of advice if you're in the public sector or even just important moves that you think could be done on a policy front to help move us in the direction where you want business to go in society. Oh, I think the simple advice I would have is put your own interest aside and work for the interest of the commons. Uh, everybody here in this country as well, and my country as well, is here thanks to someone else. Mm. Uh, the freedom that was given to you has not been, doesn't have to be translated into individual rights alone. The, the, this was a freedom for the common good, to create a country that had became an enormous force in the globe. And uh, we should not forget that the reason that you're here is thanks to everybody else in the world making that possible as well. And if you are successful, like this country certainly is by many standards, then it's also your responsibility uh, to ensure that that same happens in other parts of the world. And that's a, that's a big responsibility, we understand that. But the US has always played it, and when and, and where it plays that well, uh, I think it's not only to the benefit of mankind, but to the benefit of the US ultimately again as well. Great, well please join me in thanking Paul Pullman. I think Freddie Heineken would be proud, and, and I think it's, um, Hopefully we will have more leadership like this. So thank you very much, everybody. This looks brilliant. Yeah, and I would be, re I'm a very bad MC. I'm not quite sure at this point if I, who I invite up, but I'd like to also thank Ambassador Baking and oh, forgive me, okay. Not, not a bad MC, bad hosting. Hello, uh, host. I, I, was, uh, I, was, <laughs> I was late, uh, unfortunately. I'm Bill Heisinger, uh, congressman from this part of the state of Michigan, uh, the, uh, this also known as part, a bit of the duchy part, uh, and I'm co-chair of the, uh, the, the Dutch caucus, as we refer to it, with my, uh, with my friend Derek Kilmer, uh, who's the, the newer to this, and uh, very pleased uh, to be here. Um, and uh, I, I, first of all, would like to thank the, uh, the Kingdom of the, uh, uh, the Embassy, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and, uh, and Ambassador Beckink, uh, always doing a phenomenal job. Uh, Jan, your leadership last night uh, with, the, with the dinner, uh, the Netherlands business community and the Netherlands American Foundation for their leadership in uh, helping to put this together. And uh, congratulations to you again, Paul. We had a wonderful dinner last night and an opportunity. Um, it might be a little early here in the United States to toast you with a Heineken, uh, but we know it's afternoon in, in Europe, so uh, maybe, we, maybe we should uh, go visit the Heineken house. But uh, we, uh, we want to thank you all again for attending. Uh, this was uh, the one-year uh, anniversary of the rolling out of the Holland on a Hill and that unified brand that uh, is hopefully allowing us 
to, uh, to make some penetration as Derek and I are going around uh, telling our colleagues about the, uh, really that outsized influence that, uh, that the Netherlands has had, both on our, in, uh, our history here in the United States, but also the impact it's had on the world. Uh, we've elected a couple of more duchies, uh, one from Michigan, a guy named John Molinar, uh, another one, uh, 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 from Mr. Newhouse from uh, Washington State. Uh, and uh, we know we're making some impact. I was at a dinner the other night with uh, my chairman, Chairman Henseling of the Financial Services Committee. Uh, I serve as one of the subcommittee chairs, and we were at a dinner, and he got up and introduced me as all things Dutch, uh, Mr. Heisinga. And uh, so we know we're making some impact, and uh, we want to invite you to return and come to our Holland on a Hill uh, events, and very much looking forward to that. So. I think with that, uh, we, uh, Derek and I have to go to votes, they're, uh, they're going to be calling votes here, and uh, we uh, deeply appreciate uh, your time and attendance here, and uh, again, congratulations Paul and the work that you and Unilever are doing, and uh, to Heineken as well for, uh, for your sponsorship of this. So. Photos, I believe, and also I should point out the inaugural winner, uh, Amazon CTO uh, Winner Vogels, has sent in his personal congratulations to you. So he feels like they've uh, exceeded him this year. So thank you, Congressman Kilmer Heisinger and Ambassador Baking.